Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'd like to present part six of my series on the selected gross pathology of non-human primates. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me these images over the years, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Part six won't take too long. We're going to talk about the hematolymphatic system of non-human primates. Our first lesion is one that you don't want to see because it's really going to ruin your day. This is a cross-section of the spleen, and the spleen is markedly enlarged by tremendous amounts of fibrin, which expands the red pulp, and hemorrhage, which fills the marginal sinus outlining the white pulp. And this is a lesion that is characteristic for a number of viruses, including the arteriovirus that causes simian hemorrhagic fever, and some very nasty filoviruses causing Ebola and Marburg. The hemorrhage in the marginal zone of the white pulp is a very particular gross image that is not seen in any other condition. Another characteristic uh, lesion in these particular animals is hemorrhage and necrosis at the entrance to the duodenum. Those two particular lesions are going to cause you some significant problems. I don't like to use a lot of histo in these lesions, but it's worth illustrating this marginal uh, sinus hemorrhage and also the extensive amount of polymerized fibrin that has come through the walls of damaged vessels and fills the red pulp. One of the other issues about uh, at least the filoviruses, is their predilection to cause severe hepatic damage resulting in marked liver necrosis, depletion of the ability to make coagulation factors, which contributes to the hemorrhage that are seen in these animals and patients. Okay, we are looking at a spleen in an animal that may have been living outdoors. There are a lot of uh, zoo animals, a lot of captive reared animals that occasionally have access to the outdoors and as I always say if it can fit in the mouth it goes in the mouth and one <clears throat> one of the things that primates especially like to eat are rodents so if a rodent scurries into the cage chances are that 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 uh, animal is going to smash it and eat it and there is a significant potential for transmission of of rodent-borne disease. This is why so many primate centers have rigorous rodent control and sentinel testing program. A condition that uh, may be spread by rodents or rabbits, as well as waterborne outbreaks, is a particularly hot gram-negative agent known as Francisella tularensis, or tularemia. There are three forms of tularemia. Uh, in affected mammals. One is the typhoidal form, which is essentially the septic form, often coming in through breaks in the skin or through the mucous membranes. These animals will develop sepsis and areas of necrosis in multiple organs. Like most hot gram negatives, these animals zone in on the lymphoid tissue, primarily affecting the ileum, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the spleen ultimately getting into the portal areas through ulceration of the uh, intestinal mucosa in areas of lymphoid tissue, and zooming into the lungs where they will set up areas of necrosis as well. The triad of ileal necrosis, mesenteric lymph node necrosis, and splenic necrosis is classic for hot gram negatives, of which Francisella is one. There are two other forms that we will see Francisella uh, in mammalian hosts. And this would include the ulceroglandular form, which is the most common in people. Generally results in a uh, reaction at the site of inoculation, whether it is by a infected tick or deer fly or the bite of a occasionally asymptomatic animal. Um, cats ha are the most common to transmit to humans, but occasionally you'll see a lot of other mammalian species do it. And you'll see that area of inflammation which may ulcer 
uh, eventually become an ulcer or a, a chancre. And then the draining lymph node will generally be enlarged and tender. This particular condition, if identified, responds very well to antibiotics. The third form and the one associated with most fatalities is the pneumonic form in which the, the agent is aerosolized, often seen in people who mow lawns or cut brush or farm, in which large numbers of agents are inhaled directly into the lung with fairly devastating results. Here is, from the same animal, a very enlarged and necrotic mesenteric lymph node. Okay, so, but this can be any type of hot gram negative, including salmonella, as well as francisella, and another agent which is very commonly seen in the deaths of, of monkeys in the, these small roadside zoos, and that is Yersinia, either Yersinia enterocolitica, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. It is also a hot gram negative with potent endotoxins. So when the body attacks it, it sort of um, explodes, a time bomb. Um, and here we have the very necrotic and enlarged and hemorrhagic mesenteric lymph node, the spleen, and the liver. And remember, there's no lymphoid tissue that's interested in the liver. This just happens as a result of ulceration of the intestinal tract and absorption of the bacteria into the circulation. Um, Yersinia is a bit different histologically from the other agents in that it forms very large colonies within the affected tissues. You can't miss them. So when you see large tissues in a mass of necrosis in the intestine or the spleen or the liver of these animals, you want to think of Yersinia first. Um, you really need PCR culture to differentiate pseudotuberculosis from enterocolitica. You can't identify them based on morphology. So remember, Yersinia has a major cause of death in roadside animals. I don't know if this really belongs in the uh, uh, hemolymphatic system, but I didn't know where to put it. I don't have an eyelid system. Um, and this is a very tragic picture is a tragic picture because the way that we test for tuberculosis, and we've already spoken about tuberculosis once in this series, is uh, injection of mammalian old tuberculin into the eyelid. Because monkeys aren't very good about, you know, getting back to you in 48 hours after they've been injected in the fore forelimb. So we need something that we can see across the cage, across the pen, and uh, the swelling that's associated with the type 4 reaction to mammalian tuberculin is something that you are not going to miss. Unfortunately, there is a, uh, a fairly substantial level of uh, mycobacterium avium infected animals that show weak positivity. So it's not a, uh, a foolproof process. And unfortunately, these animals are going to be culled due to the potential of spread to other macaques or even the human handlers because macaques are exquisitely susceptible to mycobacterium tuberculosis, especially rhesus macaques. Once again, it's a disease of captivity, not seen in animals in the wild, but somewhere along the line from when this animal was captured, um, it has come in contact with a TB positive handler who has spread the disease. In the previous lecture on respiratory disease, we looked at a number of pictures of TB in the lungs, the caseating granulomas. But you can also pick up uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis in other organs, especially if an infected lung or an infected lymph node is ruptured into a bloodstream, and then you will get very small, um, almost miliary dissemination of the disease within the spleen, within the lungs, in this great picture of an experimental infection from Dr. Ed Klein of the University of Pittsburgh. So don't think that uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis always causes these huge granulomas. They can be very miliary as well. Something that also can result in miliary abscesses throughout the body is a condition 
which is colloquially known as pseudoglanders, was caused by the agent Burkholderia pseudomallei, usually seen in uh, uh, animals that are captured from the Far East. And this was a real problem with American soldiers returning from the war in, uh, in Vietnam because this agent uh, is a gram-negative bacteria that is present in the soil. I'm sorry, I called it pseudoglanders. It's actually melioidosis. Um, but it's ubiquitous in the soil, and it will get into a cut, and it will go fairly latent. It grows slowly, and before the first clinical signs are seen, it causes abscesses in almost every organ. Here, this was a case of a wild-caught monkey, um, which went down in a laboratory research facility in the United States, and you can see multiple abscesses in the liver, in the kidney, and this organ was uh, the prostate, which was actually submitted to the Wednesday slide conference from which I got this picture. Because of the uh, fairly long-standing development of infection and the severe results after a period of years, the condition was referred to in these returning American soldiers as the Vietnamese time bomb. Uh, other rule outs for something like this would obviously be uh, uh, TB, Yersinia, and Klebsiella pneumoniae, which causes a syndrome very similar to shipping fever and can cause this form of disseminated abscessation in the body. Here's an extremely pale Aotus monkeys. My experience with Aotus monkeys working with them in the Army in the late 80s and early 90s um, revealed a triad of lesions, which are very common to the genotype that we were using at the time. Some of these animals derived from this particular line are still in use, and I recently met a researcher in Australia that were using animals derived from this particular line and having the same exact problems. I've already showed you one of the lesions in that uh, colony of monkeys, which is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The animals also had a vitamin E responsive hemolytic anemia. Um, and the third one is a uh, nephritis and hypertension associated with nephritis. And, and are they, were they three independent conditions? Were they all interrelated with the changes in the uh, kidney and the mild hemolytic anemia resulting in cardiac hypertrophy as it has to work hard to maintain the uh, metabolic rate and the oxygen in man's these monkeys? I don't think we ever figured it out. But the hemolytic anemia is not seen in all of the genotypes that, uh, of the nine genotypes that, of owl monkeys that are used in research. People have, there's a much more demand for certain types of genotypes which don't have this problem. But as we look, the, the, because of the low-grade hemolytic anemia, um, if they were given uh, vitamin E, they tended to, uh, it tended to be responsive, but you can never document a uh, deficiency of vitamin E in these animals. But they had enlarged spleens, which were darkly discolored, had a lot of pigment, and hemocytorin pigment within Kupfer cells as a result of the anemia, and the spleens themselves were enlarged and uh, very dark as a result of extra, uh, extra vascular hemolysis. So that's uh, vitamin E responsive anemia in Aotus monkeys. Malaria continues to be a leading cause of mortality in the world today, and primates are, are the most widely used models to uh, examine its effects on the human body. Over the years, owl monkeys, especially splenectomized ones, have been the gold standard for research in malaria studies. There are four species of human malarial parasites, including Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium malariae, and Plasmodium ovale, which has been used for research uh, into human malaria. But monkeys also have a number of uh, agents which cause simian malaria, including Plasmodium nolzi, which is now considered an emerging zoonotic pathogen, and Plasmodium cotinii, which has been uh, recently written up in veterinary pathology by Dr. Eric Lombardini. Um, and there are a number of more papers coming out, and he's done some excellent work in that area 
um, documenting the natural disease as well as its similarities to human malaria. One of the classic signs of malaria in, uh, in humans and in infected uh, non-human primates is going to be the presence of sort of watery uh, anemic blood and very enlarged dark grayish brown livers and spleen due to the tremendous deposition of erythrocyte pigment in the form of hemosiderin in these organs. The bone marrow is often dark red in these animals because it is a hyperplastic response. You may see uh, congestion of the kidneys and in some of the uh, uh, of the, the malarial parasites have evolved a very interesting method of survival by infecting erythrocytes and causing an elaboration of adhesion molecules which cause these erythrocytes to become very sticky in the capillaries of the body and prevents them from circulating and going to the spleen where they're going to be taken out of circulation by the resident reticuloendothelial population. Um, in these cases, generally the congestion is most commonly seen in the brain. The cerebrum takes on a very pink appearance, often known as pink brain. There are a number of things that will cause lysis of infected erythrocytes here. These infected erythrocytes, um, when you examine the blood, have evidence of uh, uh, hemozoman pigment, often in the shape of a ring. And you can get direct lysis as a result of parasite invasion. You can get indirect hemolysis due to the uh, uh, elevation of circulating factors, um, which will cause indirect lysis including some endotoxin-like substances, some specific parasite products. And of course, the major way that these uh, infected erythrocytes are taken care of is through uh, splenic removal. I will direct everyone to the, uh, the recent paper by Dr. Lombardini and his colleagues um, which details the disease associated with Plasmodium cotinii infection. Here you can see sort of that very enlarged brownish liver that is characteristic of malaria in non-human primates. Let's go ahead and finish this lecture with a couple of, uh, of parasites which may not really uh, belong in the hemolymphatic system, but I didn't know where else to put them, so here they are. We are looking at uh, a case of filariasis in the abdomen of a New World primate. In New World primates, these are usually dipetalanema, um, dipetalanema gracile, dipetalanema marmosete, tamarinus, etc. In uh, Old World primates, it's usually Edison filaria meliensis. These are long filarid parasites which sit within the peritoneal cavity and they really don't do much of anything. And we see these type of filarial parasites in a wide range of species and of course marmoset, uh, new and old world monkeys are going to have theirs as well. Finally, these sort of curved embedded uh, uh, degenerate arthropods. Uh, often found in the amentum of the serosal or pleural surfaces in infected macaques are pentastomes. In old world monkeys, they may be armillifer armillatus, and new world monkeys, there are several species of porocephalus. Um, these are degenerate arthropods, um, and you will often find them singly and very uh, broken down and mineralized. When I use the term degenerate arthropods, they don't have some of the body structures but they will degenerate over time and you'll find them as just sort of mineralized concretions. Cool thing about that is that no matter how badly they break down, if you put a Movats trichrome, uh, sorry, a Movats pentachrome on that, you will find these spiracles of these, you know, regularly spaced little breathing tubes will hold up forever and ever and they will stain very prominently black on the Mo, uh, the Movat Pentachrome. Thank you, Dr. Hank Gardner, 
parasitologist extraordinaire for that bit of information, which has been very helpful over the years. Um, the adults of Porocephalus and Armillifer are found in snakes, so there's one of those parasites that uh, um, have to complete its life cycle in the snake. Okay, well that concludes uh, this lecture. It seems to be one of my shortest at about 20 minutes, so thank you for uh, your attention, and we will come back in the next lecture in this series, Lecture 7 and possibly 8, and talk about the gastrointestinal system of non-human primates. And I look forward to seeing you again then. Have a great day.